A time comes in the life of every race when people are driven by echoes of the past to chart a course for an exalted future. Africa is a place treasured. As major actors in the Africa arena plus a renaissance towards common destiny, let's pedal across the streams of yesterday through the back streets of Africa to the defining roles of policymakers, the political realities of the African nation, balance of power, and the strive to sustain national interest and identity. Join us on Network Africa on Channels Television. Network Africa, the rally point for the magics of a new Africa. Hello again and welcome to Network Africa with me, Cynthia Are. It's been a very bumpy ride concerning the murder of Riva Steenkamp. After having secured bail for a couple of weeks, the Paralympic star Oscar Pistorius appeared in court again to be given his sentence after having been found guilty of culpable homicide as opposed to murder. Here's a look at how things went and what the outcome was. It's been yet another grueling and stressful week for the steam camps. They have had to endure sitting through yet another week of being reminded of the loss of their daughter. And the next words were, allegedly shot his girlfriend. And I remember saying to my husband, I hope to God he is cheating on Reva. In truth, they could never get her back. But just like every family that has had to go through losing a loved one in the way Reva Stinkamp was killed, they want some form of justice. The fact that the matter had been kept confidential at the request of Mr. Pistorius' legal advisers has also not been placed on record. If the defense team had their way, Oscar wouldn't serve time in jail. He would do some form of community service or be placed under house arrest. In and out, wishing and coming in. Understandably, the state prosecutor was offended and protested. There is no way in this judgment that the accused had no intention to shoot. You're wrong. Three years. Only three years? Three years correction of supervision. And you think that that is in the interest of society, that reflects the seriousness of the crime, that somebody should be sent to three years correction of supervision for having killed an innocent woman in a house? The following day, the defense continued to argue its case, saying that prison would do nothing but break him further. This is the opinion of the author that incarceration of the accused taking his physical disability and his emotional, psychological and psychiatric state into consideration can only impact negative and intensely on the person of the accused and the fact, the fact place him in, and in fact place him in danger. It will not assist him but would break him as a person. It would take his future away and the broken person will be reintroduced to society. On the third day, it was time for the steam camps to tell their story and the late mother's cousin opted to lend her voice to Riva. It's terrible. It's, um, I'd say it's ruined our whole family. It's ruined Uncle Barry and Auntie June. Riva was everything to them. You know, she was the only child in PE for a long time. And they, they absolutely adored her. They were so proud of her, what she had accomplished. And they, she looked after them so well, you know, not just financially. Reva was, that's why I couldn't, I was so worried about facing them, because I didn't know how they were going to cope. I didn't think they'd be able to cope with knowing that Reva wasn't there. After that day, the steam cams returned home in order to prepare to face yet another day in court the following day. Offending behavior could be managed. Just like the people in the court. The residents of Pretoria shared mixed feelings about what the fate of Oscar should be. Many, many disabled people have been sentenced to custodial terms, so it's never ever stopped. Disability has never ever uh, stopped the courts from imposing a direct imprisonment. He must just accept what he did because he's the one who knows what happened. Because that family, they are currently going through difficult times. So in order for them for that healing, so I think he must just accept maybe after it's where they will forgive him. However, no matter what the fate of Oscar will be, his future rests in the hands of Judge Tokosile Masipa. The question everyone is asking is how long it will take. Clearly, we will all have to play the waiting game. 
Now to politics. Mozambique's ruling Frelimo party and its presidential candidates look likely to win elections this week despite voters' dissatisfaction with graft and inequality in one of Africa's fastest growing economies that boasts abundant energy reserves. Analysts say these elections provide a unique opportunity for a new president to get the country working and bring wealth to its people. 52-year-old Frederick Sabela has been a taxi driver in Mozambique's capital, Maputo, for 15 years. On a good day, he makes about $100, but he says the cost of fuel and frequent maintenance of his car due to bad roads means what it takes home is not enough to take care of his family. Now the petrol is very expensive. Yeah, it's very expensive, but the business is normal for mine. Uh, about next president, maybe. If he win Miss News, I think the life he will be right. Uh, because we promise the people that something will change. Like Sabella, most Mozambicans expect the ruling Felimo party and its presidential candidate, Philip Ngusi, to win elections this week. The advantages of incumbency and his party's historic dominance have allowed 55-year-old Yussi to run a better resourced campaign than his main challenger, veteran Renamo opposition leader, Afonso Glacama. This is despite voters' dissatisfaction with graft and inequality of one of Africa's fastest growing economies that boasts abundant energy reserves. Outgoing President Amadou Gebuza, who is barred by the Constitution from standing for a third term, has come under fire over corruption and deep divisions between the rich and the poor. Maybe one day will be uh, nice, but now the situation is very complicated about uh, corruption. Yeah. But I will believe one day the situation will, will change. The winner of Wednesday's polls will be well placed to reap the early rewards of multi-billion dollar gas and oil development in the north of the Indian Ocean nation, which though poor, is forecast by the IMF to see economic growth of more than 8% this year. Candidates have faced insistent demands from voters that Mozambique's plentiful resources, which besides offshore gas and oil, include huge coal deposits as well as farming and fisheries potential be used to generate more jobs and higher living standards. Joachim Tobias Day, president of the Mozambican Association of Economists, says Mozambicans have high expectations for the upcoming polls, and rightly so. This election time was a very good test for us, because in election times you see people uh, having their own aspirations and they start talking and say what do they expect from the country. And for us in Mozambique, it's very important that you mention that the management of the expectation of the population. Because people hear about oil and gas and they look to Qatar, they look to Russia, they look to other countries that are developing based on oil and gas, and they say, well, what, what, why are we not dead in that point? Day compares this election in strategic importance to 1994, which was the first multi-party vote after the civil war, saying leaders have to set a strategy and make the country work. We're coming to a situ from a situation in Mozambique that uh, we came from extreme poverty. We get to a point where they came hope and attractiveness of uh, in, uh, foreign direct investment in Mozambique. Now we're in, we're in a position that we understand what do we have. We have, we have population, 23 million people, that we can build up on that. We have uh, mineral resources. We have a country that we can develop agriculture to generate food and reduce imports. So now the future is in our hands regarding a strategy. Former liberation movement Frelimo has dominated voting in the ex-Portuguese colony since its 1975 independence and if successful, will take the fifth presidential ballot held since the end of a devastating 1975-1992 civil war. 
On Monday, the Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi met in Cairo with the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry to discuss the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the fight against the Islamic State militants. But as the VOA State Department correspondent Scott Stearns reports from Cairo, the Secretary of State John Kerry says the Obama administration continues to have concerns about restrictions on Egyptian civil society and its transition to democracy. Egypt's protest law allows authorities to ban any public gathering of more than 10 people. It's one of the measures blocking the full restoration of U.S. financial assistance to the new government, which continues to detain journalists and many members of the former ruling party, including Egypt's ousted president. Secretary Kerry says such restrictions on civil society continue to be part of his talks with officials here in Cairo. The foreign minister and I also discussed, as we almost always have, the essential role of a vibrant civil society, a free press, due process under law. And there's no question that Egyptian society always has been stronger and is stronger when all of its citizens have a, stay, a say and a stake in its success. Former General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi led the coup that toppled Egypt's first democratically elected leader and was then himself elected president. He told the UN General Assembly last month that he's committed to reform. Our aim is to build a new Egypt, a state that represents the rights and freedoms, honors its duties, and ensures the coexistence of its citizens without exclusion or discrimination a state that respects and enforces the rule of law and guarantees freedom of opinion. Yet some say al-Sisi must do more to show he's serious about those reforms. American University professor Akbar Ahmed. General Sisi had to, has to very quickly establish himself as a wise, sensible leader if he has to gain any credibility in the near, near future because otherwise he will have to be constantly battling this reputation of having come in as a military dictator at a time when it seemed after the Arab Spring that the time of the military dictators was over. Many members of the former ruling Muslim Brotherhood remain behind bars, as do other critics of the al-Sisi administration. Human rights lawyer and former presidential candidate Khaled Ali says President al-Sisi is misusing the law. <laughs> For example, people took to the streets to show support for Sisi. Others took to the streets against Sisi. Those who were supporting Sisi were protected by the police and could not be touched, while those who were protesting against him were arrested. Egypt is an important part of resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and of fighting Islamic State militants. But Human Rights Watch's Sarah Margon says Washington cannot let that obscure its push for civil liberties. Down the line, having human rights, basic fundamental freedoms, expression, association, assembly, um, those are all integral to national security. And if you look only short term, you're much more likely to cloud the longer term prospects for, for peace. As Cairo tries to broker a more lasting peace between Hamas and Israel, U.S. officials say Egypt's leaders must also meet the needs of their own people. Scott Stearns, VOA News, Cairo. We'll take a break now on Network Africa, but when we return, we'll be looking at how the Ebola virus disease is being handled in some of the affected African countries. We'll have details for you shortly. Please stay with us. Mm -hmm. 